Hello and welcome to the first ever virtual edition of the MEP conference. My name is Tom Oxterby, editor of MEP Middle East, and I'm so pleased you are all able to join us here today. Um, this is certainly not how we envisioned the conference would take place when we first ironed out our events calendar for 2020. But we know we are far from alone when it comes to having our plans disrupted this year. The, the outbreak of coronavirus has forced all of us to take stock of our operations, adapt to new challenges, and perhaps most importantly, gain a new perspective on both our personal and professional lives. What this pandemic and set of circumstances has offered us is the chance to demonstrate our collective agility. And I think we've got an opportunity to think even more critically about how MEP and HVAC systems can lead the conversation on a more sustainable and efficient future. Today's conference marries those two opportunities perfectly. We find ourselves in quite extraordinary times when clarity and certainty are in short supply. So moving online has allowed MEP Middle East to deliver our usual high quality conference in a safe and secure environment. Today, we are blessed to be joined by some of the sharpest minds in the sector to stoke the fires of discussion and analyze some of the most pressing talking points of our time. We have three panel discussions coming up, covering engineering net zero carbon systems, evaluating the current landscape of the MEP sector, and transitioning towards a digitalized future. Throughout the day, you'll be asked to pitch questions in the public chat panel on the side of your screen that may not be on our agenda. And I implore you to take this opportunity to pick the brains of our expert guests. I'd like to extend a huge thank you for joining us today. A huge word of thanks to our expert panelists for sharing their time and expertise. And of course, to our friends at Voltas, Polyfab and Trimble, the sponsors of today's event. So uh, without further ado, I will hand you over to our conference chair, Prabhakar Kesavan, who is regional general manager at Voltas and a skilled hand to guide us through today's agenda. Um, just while he's dialing in, I would just like to note that if there are any technical difficulties today, please remain calm as we have a team of uh, staff on hand behind the scenes in case of any hiccups. Oh, can you hear me all right now? Uh, hello, hello, sir. <laughs> Good morning, thank you all, and thank you for the patience. Sorry about that technical glitch. Uh, so, without wasting time, let's get started. We're going to have an interesting day. We have three panel sessions set up, and I'm going to get started with the first panel. Uh, you know, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, said just a couple of days ago the COVID 19 pandemic has turned the world of work upside down. The world of work cannot and should not look the same after this crisis. It's time for a coordinated global, regional and national effort to create decent work for all of us as the foundation of a green, inclusive and resilient recovery. With that said, let's start looking at some pressing topics for our industry. So first off, a first panel discussion is on the topic engineering net zero carbon system. So let me invite our panel members on. So we already see Majid Fayad on the screen and I request the other two panelists to join us as well. While they join in, Majid Fayad is technical manager for Emirates Building Council. Majid leads the technical programs of Emirates Green Building Council which includes the net zero center of excellence benchmarking program, green key and energy efficiency program. So welcome Majid. And now, now I see on screen the other two panelists as well. Philippa Grant, Director Energy and Sustainability with AESG. Philippa is Director of the Energy and Sustainable Development Division of AESG, a multidisciplinary consultancy firm headquartered in Dubai and in London. Philippa, it's interesting to note that you were involved in the certification of the UAE Pavilion at Dubai Expo 2020. I'm sure we'll hear more about, about it from you. Alan, Alan Fogati, partner and head of sustainability with Kandal. Kandal specializes in low energy and sustainable building design. And Alan heads the sustainable group, sustainability group in the for the UK and MENA. 
Alan, you had a hand with the passive building of stadia for the Sydney Olympics, and that that uh, it was very interesting to read about your background. So, without much ado, net zero carbon energy systems mean low carbon infrastructure from renewable power plants to electric vehicles, efficient appliances, and better constructed buildings. We from the MEP industry are going to specifically talk about better constructed buildings this morning. So let me kick off the panel session with an opening question. And uh, if Majid, I think given your role with uh, Emirates uh, Green Building Council, you may want to take this first. If COVID-19 has shown us anything is that we are not taking our individual as well as the planet's health seriously enough. So why is net zero critical for our future, for our future and the future of our coming generations? Ajit. Yeah, at first, thank you, Prabhakar, for the introduction and thanks for uh, ITP for the invitation. I'm very pleased to be part of the um, MEP Middle East uh, virtual conference, the first virtual conference. Um, to answer your question and in line with what you said, COVID-19 has really devastated <laughs> Uh, the lives and economies um, around the world. Yes, it brought temporarily cleaner air into cities, but this reduction, or yeah, this reduction is not enough in comparison to the total amount of reduction required to meet the Paris Agreement goals and to limit global warming by 1.5 degrees Celsius. We all agree that climate change is a global crisis. But for us in the Middle East and the Arab region, the consequences of climate change are more critical. Um, the Arab region is considered as one of the most vulnerable regions globally to the consequences of climate change as per the IPCC report 2014. Mm -hmm. um, here in the UAE, if you look at the climate change projections, you will see um, uh, there's predictions of increased two to three degrees of average temperature during summer months. 10% yeah, yeah. increase in humidity, increase in precipitation. So we need to take rapid actions mm -hmm. to avoid these harmful environmental impacts due to climate change. For us, from the building sector or the building perspective, the solution is clear. It's net zero carbon buildings. But why we need to focus on buildings in particular? Because globally, uh, buildings and the construction sector contribute to 39% of the global CO2 emissions. Here in the UAE, buildings consume, consume even more uh, and generate more carbon emissions. If you look, if you compare the average uh, consumption between buildings in the UAE and the global average or the average in Europe, you will find 1.5 to 2 uh, uh, times more. Um, if you, also, buildings here consume up to 70% of the uh, electricity in the country during several months and looking at the existing building stock you will uh, you will see that there is many inefficient buildings in terms of energy and water consumption and if you compare these inefficient buildings with best practices you'll find a huge difference uh, two to three times uh, sometimes so the building sector provides a unique opportunity uh, for us to decarbonize the economy. And we need to achieve, in line with the Paris Agreement goals, net zero carbon buildings by 2050. If you allow me, Prabhakar, I would like here to highlight our yeah. role at Emirates Green Building Council to advance the net zero movement in the UAE. Since uh, 2018, we've established our Net Zero Center of Excellence as a platform for different stakeholders to share knowledge and to learn more about Net Zero Carbon Buildings. Through our center, we also aim to drive policy and regulations, both on the local level and on the global, uh, on the regional level and on the national level, to uh, decarbonize our economy by the time frame of 2050. We also offer tools and resources, um, research to advance the net zero movement. One of our tools is the zero energy and the zero carbon building certifications in partnership with the International Living Future Institute. And these certifications provide a validation or a verification tool to buildings that achieve a net zero energy or net zero carbon level in the UAE. Most recently, we've also partnered with the UNOVA to offer a free embodied carbon tool where consultants and designers can use this tool 
to evaluate embodied carbon of building materials and benchmark. And we look forward to continuing our work to, towards decarbonizing the environment. And we invite companies as part of this um, conference to check our website and see how to be involved. Thank you. Thank you for that very, very helpful insight. Indeed, I think we are seeing the effect of increasing temperatures and humidity. It's been a very warm and humid start to this summer here in, in the Middle East, as we all are experiencing. Um, thank you for that. Uh, you know, adversity often brings opportunities. Uh, so to the other two panelists, uh, what opportunities do you see from the promotion of sustainable solutions as a result, particularly of this pandemic? Um, Philippa, Alan, either of you, please. Yeah, shall I take it? <laughs> and I guess, uh, I mean, every situation offers opportunities it's been um, it's been a, a terrible kind of uh, circumstance that we've all had to mm -hmm. manage over the last i'd say six months now um so it's definitely not been a positive time but you know you have to to make the best of every situation and you have to look at what positives can come out of um, as you said out of these adverse times um, so I'd say it, it's definitely put a sharp of focus again on sustainability um, and the fact that we do have a, you know, a global health crisis, um, mm -hmm. not just related to the coronavirus. You know, before that, there was a lot of new data that was coming out and a lot of um, uh, discussion was starting to happen around the number of deaths that were linked to poor air quality, um, yes. poor water quality. So mm -hmm. it's really thrown a, more of a light on you know the health crisis and the issues that we're facing today um they're not necessarily as visible um as previous health crises that we might have faced in in you know uh, previous centuries um but they're very much having a, a huge impact and whilst they might not be visible and tangible because we have data now um, you know, big data that we can we can analyze now um, a lot better. It's starting to show the links to to these unseen, like uh, invisible factors. Um, so I think there's definitely a, a stronger focus on on the health and wellness aspect of sustainability, and, and this is something that's been talked about anyway um, more and more recently, and it's it's kind of emphasizing that that area um, a bit more. So. Hope we'll see a lot more coming out of this in terms of improved air quality, um, new technologies, looking at how we can um, improve the air quality within cities, but also within buildings. Um, and I think there's there's a lot of really interesting research and, and new things that we will see coming on the market uh, out of that side of things. Absolutely, absolutely. Indoor air quality, in fact, I think is absolutely critical for all our well-being. So I think you. Uh, touched on a very important point that, you know, particularly MEP and HV, HVAC industry players and those of us on this uh, webinar, uh, what role do the panelists see that these two uh, specialists of the industry, MEP and the HVAC industry, have particularly to contribute or have a play in net zero ambitions? Uh, I can see that Alan is not there, so again, I can uh, throw the question to Majid, yourself and uh, Philippa. Majid, you want to take the lead, please? Yes, yes, I can. Before answering the, your question about the role of MEP, I think um, um, looking up at the promotion of sustainability practices from the angle of uh, the pandemic, we've seen, as Philippa mentioned, that health and wellness are really important, and we need to look at the role yes. of buildings in improving health and well-being. Another point that I would like to highlight due to the pandemic um, is the importance of cities' resilience and urban resilience. We need more walking spaces, we need more cycling spaces, we need to find solutions Absolutely. as well to mm -hmm. people who can't use public transportation due to the pandemic, uh, digital uh, um, infrastructure, smart infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So as you mentioned, the COVID-19 situation has set a really a new norm for living and which emphasizes mostly on healthy buildings, city resilience, um, uh, net zero, uh, circular economy and these uh, concepts. Absolutely. Uh, Do you want me to answer the question of the MEP or should I hand it over to Alan? 
Helen, uh, did you hear the question? All right. Yes, indeed. Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, NEP is absolutely vital to the net zero solution Done. because Maybe ultimately can, uh, all the CO two emissions comes from the NEP system. Um, I think uh, kind of linking it back to to MEP and HVAC, and I guess um, a lot of people joining this uh, virtual conference will be from a, an engineering and an MEP ground. Um, it's there's not really one discipline which is going to contribute towards net zero and towards mm -hmm. um, the resolution of all mm -hmm. these issues and challenges that we're facing. Um, it's going to be really important for every single discipline to come together and to tackle it as, as one. Indeed. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I oversee the, the sustainability consultancy team here at ESG, and yes, you know, the sustainability consultant um, is a almost a, a generalist, you know, you have to understand all of the different disciplines and, and the way that they all contribute towards um, the sustainability strategy and, and aspirations of a project. Um, but it goes beyond that, you know, you need the cooperation, you need the input from every single specialist discipline um, within the team. So you need, uh, there's always new technologies coming out, there's always new solutions, people need to be open to always rethinking the way they're doing things, um, you know, not just copying and pasting the previous project or, you know, the way we did it last time, constantly questioning, is there a better way we can do this? Is there a more yeah. efficient way we can do this um, mm -hmm. from a materials and uh, kind of operational consumption perspective? And um, so, yeah, it's, it's very much a, a collaboration and it really needs the whole industry to, to engage um, and to get on board and to work together um, to, to drive these Solutions Thank you. Thank you, Philippa. Alan, you were uh, wanting to add to that, I think. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, please. Yes. I, I, okay, okay, good. I, I had problems with my microphone. Um, the, the other aspect is that the, the HVAC engineer can see where the energy is actually going. So mm -hmm. on that basis, then, they're able to advise the architects what changes need to happen to the building from the very, very start, the strategy of it. So looking at areas of glass, yes. uh, opportunities for natural ventilation, passive solutions, all the things that will impact on the energy consumption, the size of systems within buildings, they can influence mm -hmm. all the, these parameters before even thinking about the design of the systems. And to my mind, that's absolutely fundamental because getting to net zero means that every aspect of low carbon energy usage has to be considered and there's no silver bullet, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's incremental. All the, the various aspects of the building have to be looked at if we're going to get to zero carbon. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Now that, that nicely leads into another question I had in my mind. Uh, you know, it's a classic chicken or egg uh, question. Does innovation lead to changes in building codes or do building codes result in driving innovation? What do you think, Adam? I think it's, it's both. Um, so sometimes codes can restrict the way people think about buildings um, so that it prevents innovation. So for example, the uh, hot water temperatures that we have to uh, heat systems to to make sure that we're not getting Legionella. And um, the question mm -hmm. is, do you need water at 35 degrees to wash your hands in the first instance? So why heat it to 65 and then cool it to 35? Maybe 20 degrees is just perfectly okay, well below the, the legion at a, a level. So that's mm -hmm. an example where, and that particularly occurs within healthcare systems. So you have very rigid ways of actually designing buildings, and we need to think about innovative ways of getting around these codes and still achieving the, the health outcome. Um, but then there's other aspects which will drive um, design forward. So for example, air leakage testing was introduced in the UK uh, about uh, 2006 and it's made an absolutely massive difference to the energy consumption of buildings uh, it's mm -hmm. improved quality etc and basically it just makes poor practice visible and it makes it possible to catch it at the point of completion of a building and that lifts the standard of, of all buildings as a result so right. it, it, it's looking to see what elements of legislation can really bring the whole industry up but at the same time, allowing enough flexibility for innovation to, to move the industry forward. Right, right. Thank you for that. Um, do you think legislation is moving forward you know, quickly enough, consistently enough across our 
geography, especially the Middle East and the GCC countries where we operate in uh, Majid. Um, so here in the UAE, uh, the government has put concerted focus on legislation and green buildings in particular. We have uh, three building um, regulation codes that are mandated across three emirates in Abu Dhabi, Dubai and Ras Al Khaimah, Istidam Operating System, Dubai Green Building Regulations and Specifications mm -hmm. and uh, Bergil most recently in um, uh, Ras Al Khaimah. I believe that these uh, codes um, provide uh, the, uh, the foundation towards improving the new buildings uh, energy and water performance, sustainability performance and reducing their emissions. They also cultivate um, a culture of innovation towards using new technologies and innovations. Yeah. Um, but I believe that we need to embrace more visionary regulations that doesn't, don't only include uh, these minimum requirements, uh, prescriptive, prescriptive requirements, but also include some uh, criteria and principles of net zero, net zero carbon principles, which means mm -hmm. we need to include more uh, performance-based uh, metrics, um, deep renovations, uh, life cycle costing, life cycle assessment, uh, um, and uh, this would definitely, the improvement of these regulations would definitely open for uh, the market for more innovations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, I was reading something recently. I think uh, the, the model of the industry is moving from a, a project-based industry to a product-based industry, as in it's packaged products or packaged solutions which are brought together as an MEP installation or then a final built product. I think uh, this gives us the option of ensuring a product which complies with all these uh, regulations and legislations be it, it is put together in a factory environment off-site and then brought in. I'm, I'm sure we'll touch on these in the, the other panel discussions as well. Um, one question I'd like to throw open to all of the panelists is, um, you know, net zero uh, is, is a nice aspiration, ambition, but how many years are we really away from getting there uh, to make, to, for it to become a, you know, a standard construction practice? Um, can I start with Philippa? What do you think? Um, I mean, it's a difficult question. Uh, mm. Look, if if everyone tomorrow woke up and said, we want all of our projects to be net zero, we could do it now. There's nothing mm. stopping us. Technology is available. Um, the design solutions are available. You know, we're working on net, pro uh, net zero projects here in the region. Um, mm. Really is going to be, you know, it needs a concerted effort for people to seriously want to do this, um, to want to work together to, to make it happen, um, and to, to invest in it as well. It's, um, you know, there, there obviously is a, a cost impact attached to, to any yeah. enhanced performance building, you know, not necessarily going all the way to net zero, but if you care about the performance of your building and you want a better performing building, you have mm -hmm. to invest a little bit more. Um, which you know you you then get into talks about payback and and you know we can all i think all of us talk <laughs> anyone to death about how you know it's worth it and you're going to get your money back and you know long-term thinking mm -hmm. um but really it's it's a mindset um shift i think um and it's going to really take a lot of people to to turn around and say yes you know what we're just going to do it um, and I think touching on your point about legislation, it comes, mm -hmm. it comes from both sides. You know, there needs to be a, a push from government. Um, as, mm -hmm. You know, in this region, it's very much been a, a government-led and a, a, a top-down approach. Um, you know, we have a very forward-thinking uh, leadership here, and they really do want to push the agenda of sustainability, and, and that's been great. It really has kind of driven um, the uptake of, of these principles within the industry. Um, so there is an element of needing to add it into legislation. Um, we need to change the way we think about legislation. I think touching on Alan's point, it needs to become more performance-based solutions, more engineered mm -hmm. options, not just uh, prescriptive regulations that you know have proven to have a, a massive performance gap when it comes to operation. Um, and it needs the industry to 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 engage and, and to want to drive it. So it, it needs everyone to, to get together and push it. Um, realistically, we're probably some few years off, <laughs> off of that. Yeah. And I think 
will be the same as you know any kind of new wave of thinking rolls out there will be the pioneers the, the first to, to do it and the first to get the net zero buildings in the region and you know they're the ones that are going to benefit long term from being able to say we were the first you know we came here we started this yeah. um and slowly everyone will will get on board but yeah it will uh, i guess be some years <laughs> until yeah. that happens Absolutely, I think. Uh, but the sooner we make a start, the better. Like Tom says, maybe this crisis is, in a way, wiping the slates uh, clean and starting afresh with renewed vigor and renewed energy. While I, before I move on to the other panelists with the same question, can I uh, again throw the opportunity to the audience who are listening and who joined us today? You know, if you have any specific questions or comments on this topic, feel free to post them on the chat box that you see on the screen and we'll be happy to pick that up uh, at the end of this panel discussion with the panelists still on, on, on uh, with us. Um, so uh, uh, Majid, you know, you're of 2030 as a target set by the UAE government to get to some targets. Uh, do you think with what's happened, we're going to get there sooner or is there going to be a delay in achieving those targets for 2030? Um, so yeah, this is the question of time, the big question of time. <laughs> so globally, as you mentioned, we have a target first of all on the building sector that is set by World Green Building Council to achieve uh, net zero carbon, operational carbon by 2030 for new buildings and for, mm -hmm. all for all buildings, including the existing buildings, net zero carbon by 2050. World Green Building Council is also putting targets on embodied carbon, 40% um, reduction of the upfront embodied carbon uh, in buildings is required by 2030 and net zero embodied carbon by 2050 as well. So looking at these targets and in order to achieve the Paris Agreement goals and answering the, your question about time, I think mm -hmm. we don't have time, we don't have the luxury of time. We need to act fast and rapidly yeah. now. Um, and we need to look at all aspects, starting from designing the buildings, selection of building materials, construction, operation, maintenance, refurbishment, uh, even demolition of buildings. All of these should incorporate net zero principles within them. Uh, we need to act fast and we need to do it. We have only 10 years to do it by 2030. Yeah. And really the coming couple of years are foundational um, in terms of taking the rapid actions to, uh, towards achieving net zero. And it requires work, as Philippa mentioned, from government, strategies, policies, and also involving all stakeholders, manufacturers, suppliers, to designers, consultants, facility managers, and everyone. I am optimistic, and um, I really think that partnerships and collaboration between the private sector and the uh, uh, public sector is a key in achieving that. Mm -hmm. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Uh, couldn't, couldn't agree with you more there. Uh, Alan, would you like to add to that, please, in terms of your expectations or your uh, views on how soon things need to happen and how things will, uh, will realistically happen? Uh, I, I certainly think in the UK it's going to happen quickly. So we, mm. we will have zero carbon buildings by 2030 without a doubt. Um, we're working on zero carbon schools for the Department for Education. So to work out what is exactly does that mean? What what needs to change in schools to achieve that? Um, mm -hmm. We're working with contractors to deliver pilot zero carbon schools and exactly the same process is going on. Same things happening in pretty much all governmental departments. Um, mm -hmm. Most commercial clients now are saying they want uh, net zero carbon. They don't quite know what that means, and we're working out, we're working through that with them. I think a key point which uh, Philip Philip touched on is the kind of performance gap, and the, the 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 issue for me is that as an industry we have not done proper predictive energy calculations. Uh, so using systems like the Australian Neighbour system is the way we should be looking at buildings. So we're actually trying to accurately predict what. The building will actually consume and the, the the real point about that means that as at the design stage as engineers we can actually see what the systems are likely to do and then make the changes necessary to make sure that the building performs properly and mm -hmm. as an industry we have failed very badly in terms of clo closing that a uh, gap to understand how a building actually is performing and what design changes and what lessons learned 
are um, are are gleaned from from existing buildings and how they're working. Um, mm -hmm. What's going to be a far more difficult task everywhere, I think, is the 2050 target for existing buildings because there are so many of them and there are so many that are in really poor condition and to get those upgraded to a standard that would be equivalent to zero carbon is going to be a massive task and it will take a huge amount of effort and people really need to think about it because the sheer number of buildings that would have to be done is just phenomenal. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, in fact, you, you bring an interesting point. It's one is constructing new buildings to meet required standards, and the other is existing building, buildings. And like Majid also mentioned, there's a role clearly of facility uh, management companies, ESCO is talked about, and you're talking about uh, retrofits, etc. You know, where do you feel the MEP hard services FM companies? You know, the role that they have, and do we have? the right level and the sophisticated service that we need from these companies. Uh, do, do you see enough of it? Or what do, what do this segment of the NEP industry, the FM, FM players, have to contribute here? Well, I, I, I see kind of a lot of FM maintenance groups are very much reactive. So mm. it's only when something goes wrong will they actually um, go and, and sort out the problem. and. We're seeing clients now saying they want their existing stock to be net zero. Um, we have done and are doing feasibility studies as to how you would get rid of, for example, gas-fired boilers and put in heat pumps instead. Um, so some of these systems make perfect sense. So if you've got a lot of heating and cooling in the building, then you can take the heat from the cooling system and put it into the heating system and it justifies itself. And I, I think facilities groups that are very close to the buildings could get a much better understanding as to how well the buildings are performing, so what improvements yeah. can be made to the systems themselves, but then equally be able to suggest changes to be made to the, to, to the buildings, because it's not an easy thing. If you've got an office building with multiple tenancies, then you have to be quite strategic as to how and when you make the upgrades to the building. And what does that mean to the systems? What changes need to ha happen to allow that progressive um, changeover to more energy efficient systems? So I, I think facilities groups could do an awful lot more uh, and they, they need to think about this. Indeed, uh, I think the whole concept of uh, moving from PPM, predictive preventative maintenance to condition based, uh, condition -based maintenance and monitoring, you know, basically IoT-based solutions to monitor uh, from a remote basis in real-time uh, alerts, consumption, anomalies, etc. I think there's a there's an important role for FM players to to, to contribute here. Surely, um, thank you for that, uh, Alan. Now let me just move to see if there are any questions from our audience here. Um, there's a question from Elias here. Uh, he asks, would you say that MEP consultants feel empowered to challenge status quo uh, or do it as we always have? Like I think, Philippa, you mentioned that earlier. Or is it the easiest route for them to just do it uh, as it has been done before? No loss of billable hours, unbillable hours, he says. Uh, would you like to comment on that, Philippa? <laughs> Well, yes, it's definitely so just always do as you have done before. <laughs> uh, I think uh, there's no kind of uh, question about that. But, um, you know, everyone has the power to, to make a change. Um, whether it's, you know, just questioning in a design team meeting, is this the best way to do it? Um, perhaps we could do, uh, you know, provide an alternative solution. Um, you know, educating ourselves. Uh, I think all of us on this panel have spent a long time educating ourselves on net zero and what are the best solutions and you know what can we discuss in on our projects and um you know it's, it's a continual educational um uh, role it's you know it's a very new discussion and we don't have the solutions yet so um i think everyone has the power to to make a change and, and no one should feel that they don't um, regardless of what their position on a, on a project is um yeah challenge your team challenge your Challenge your managers, challenge your architects, um, you know, put yourself out there and uh, yeah, it'll be, you'll be surprised at, at what's back, I think. 
Yeah. Uh, Mohammed Osman asked the question: If developers were to be rewarded by governments and authorities, perhaps that they would consider incorporating zero emission design solution to buildings. Imagine, um, uh, you know, uh, rewarding and in incentivizing developers. Is that something you're considering uh, in terms of what that you're doing? Um, so yeah, de developers depends in the U in the UAE you have two types of developers. There are developers that are really concerned about uh, their environmental performance. We have, um, uh, for example, Majid al Futaim is one of uh, the first uh, companies uh, globally that joined the net zero carbon commitment and they have a net zero, a net positive uh, strategy as well to positive on energy and water. So they have like um, ambitious targets in terms for their new and for their existing buildings. But there are other developers that don't care, you know, so um, we have recently conducted uh, a deep retrofit uh, study uh, to examine the, uh, the feasibility, the challenges and the opportunities for deep retrofits in the UAE or retrofits beyond the current uh, renovation um, rates up to 50% of the energy consumption. And we've conducted a study with developers in particular. Uh, the study will be uh, launched later this year, showing the results of what developers would prefer. Is it mandating retrofits or uh, mandating energy labeling schemes? Um, would it keep uh, keeping the retrofit market as more voluntary? Um, the results will be, I, I don't want to share the results now because it would be part of the report, but it's very interesting to see how the developers in the market are maturing and also pushing uh, the agenda forward uh, in terms of retrofits and achieving sustainability targets and net zero. Mm -hmm. uh, picking on the same point, uh, Colin Bridges poses a question. He says, should we be doing more in educating building owners on the viability of cost saving retrofit solutions. So sh how should we do it? I think should we be doing more? Answer is yes. But I'd rather ask the question is how can we go about doing this? Uh, Alan, would you like to take that please? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, I, I think we need to have a very pragmatic view on net zero. And when, when we look at these things, we have to look at them in terms of whole life cycle. And mm -hmm. it's whole life cycle carbon as well as whole life cycle cost. And the two are intrinsically linked. And cost is a, our, our, our budget is a finite resource which has to be spent very wisely. And yeah. for, for example, on a project we're looking at, the, the first reaction is, well, we must go for a CLT or timber uh, soffit uh, to re reduce the embodied carbon for the, the building. And the question I've asked is, well, if we go concrete, yes, it's higher embodied carbon, but it's 30% less cost. And if we take that 30% budget and spend it somewhere else in the building, are we going to get more carbon reduction for our, um, for our available budget? And I think that's the kind of question that needs to be asked. And the same thing goes for, for example, universities over here. They usually are old buildings, not very well performing, etc. And if you put a heat pump onto a building like that, it costs an awful mm -hmm. lot of more money to, um, to to keep it uh, heated. If you put a combined heat and power onto it, it saves hundreds of thousands of pounds each year, so, but it doesn't mm -hmm. save any carbon emissions. So the strategy I would propose in that case was take the savings, invest it in the building's envelopes to improve them. At the end of 10, 15 years, replace the CHP then with a heat pump, but against yeah. a far lower uh, energy building demand. So it mm -hmm. needs to be pragmatic in terms of the solutions to these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I think that makes perfect sense. It's it's, uh, it's it's two ways of getting there, and I think that's a, that's a wonderful way of uh, articulating that. Uh, would either of you, Philippa, uh, Majid, want to add to that? To what Alan said. Then? Um, I want to actually add another point about the role mm -hmm. of the MEP and the HVAC industry. We spoke about. Um, the role that uh, by providing technologies and systems that are efficient for buildings to reduce energy consumption, but we also need to think about the manufacturing uh, part of the MEP mm -hmm. and the impact system. And, uh, uh, we, spoke about, yeah, we spoke about embodied carbon. Uh, globally, 11% of uh, uh, the global emissions come from embodied carbon. 
and these are uh, emissions associated with building materials, systems, and construction processes. Um, even though um, cement and steel contribute to two thirds of the total embodied carbon of a building for year one, however, mm -hmm. after considering the life cycle and considering after 50 years, 100 years, the, um, the embodied carbon due to refurbishment, system changes, including MEP and HVAC changes, would, would have a contribution on the embodied carbon. And here we need to really look at transforming our manufacturing processes for systems, including MEP and HVAC systems, to be more efficient, use less energy, less uh, uh, emissions, and thus contributing to a lower life cycle uh, embodied carbon emissions. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a very uh, in interesting, important point to finish on its entire supply chain leading up to the construction on site, which we need to look at. Uh, I have to apologize here. I took a few minutes at the outset to join in, so we've lost a few precious minutes. We could have continued uh, uh, discussing this topic uh, a little more. However, I'm sure you're all available to the audience, to the rest of us, to so that we can reach out and ask you any spe specific question. Let me say a huge thank you to you for joining us this morning and some very interesting and in interest, insightful uh, information that you've shared with us uh, on an absolutely critical topic. So thank you and uh, uh, for taking the time and I appreciate you being there again. Thank you, panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhakar. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, with that wonderful start to this morning session, it's time for us to move on to the next topic for today. So I invite the panelists for the topic, evaluating the current landscape of the MEP sector. Uh, so I invite the panelists to join in and we hope to see them coming in uh, and uh, being seen on the screen. So we have Mr. A.R. Suresh Kumar, Vice President and Head of International Operations for Voltas Limited, a 30 plus year industry veteran. Suresh, you've seen it all, you've been everywhere, India, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and, and we're going to get some interesting views from you, I'm, I'm sure. Then we have Pedro Karima. Uh, bon dia, Pedro. Bon dia. From, from Portugal, a wonderful place that I like in Brazil as well, a couple of my favorite countries. Associate Director, Bureau of Hopal Engineering, with experience in building services, engineering, design, simulation, project management, commercial management, and construction. Your experience, I know, includes, among many other sectors, law and order. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's a made for an interesting uh, insight. So I'll be not careful. Because, not because, because I was in jail. Time. Uh, Just because oh, I yeah. was helping in Alamani, support. <laughs> Co-founder GRFN, a multidisciplinary consultancy firm. And you were recognized as a distinguished alumni entrepreneur by the American University of Sharjah, I noticed in 2014 on yeah, Very impressive. Uh, and then last but not least, Martin McFadden, Director of MEP Engineering with Q International Consultants, with over 38 years of professional experience in MEP Building Services Engineering. You have worked in the UK, Ireland, Portugal, Canada, USA, Turks and Caicos Islands, Bahrain, Singapore, Bermuda, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait. Wow. <laughs> Martin, you've been around the block, haven't you? Uh, so without much more ado, the topic. Most countries have declared the construction industry and by extension the MEP industry as essential or critical. So in a way of speaking, construction MEP uh, work has continued through the COVID-19 pandemic. However, surely the industry is not immune from the impact of the pandemic. So let's hear from these experts on how the industry has been impacted, how they see the industry dealing with coping with it, and also seeing the opportunities with this crisis has thrown at us. So to start off, my first question to the panel, as best as you can, can you outline the current crisis, uh, how the current crisis has impacted operations in your company, including your supply chain? So can I request, uh, Suresh, if you would like to kick off with that uh, question, please? Yeah, good morning, Prabhakar, and uh, thank you, ITP, for organizing a great seminar, which is, I think, you know, 
the COVID mix uh, makes us very close uh, with all these digital barriers and uh, all the barriers broke and today we are all very close to each other. Uh, coming on to the subject of uh, COVID, uh, I believe it was 2002-2004 we had the uh, SARS in uh, Singapore and Hong Kong. Uh, as uh, most of you are aware actually, Voltas, we work uh, across the region, we work in Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, GCC, etc. So for us, uh, uh, 2002, 2004, we have gone through the SARS crisis at that time. So in February, early February, we had this indication from our Singapore operations that there is something called the COVID is mm -hmm. affecting all of us. And uh, there was a lot of impact. And uh, what we did immediately was we formed a cross-functional team. But what was the learning from the earlier SARS impact was uh, don't leave this just to the health and safety or a HR professional or an admin professional. So we formed a uh, cross-functional team which is consisting of various senior leadership of the uh, international operations of all tasks. So we daily met and started discussing about early information. To be frank, those days we had only information from the WhatsApp universities where only mm -hmm. the personal messages were available. So. We collected a lot of things. We started taking step by step. We first thing what we did is actually we ensured that all the uh, staff who were outside the locations were brought in, and those who wanted to emergency go out told very clearly we have no idea. You better go, but I think stay safe in the clear. Then of course all the blue collar workers, the engineer supervisors were given proper advice, etc. In fact, for us, this particular CFT was very effective in actually transferring the communication from the top to bottom. And we we formed smaller teams at the locations and projects. So each project, they started taking care of it. Then the safety toolbox talks changed their uh, style. They started adding more into hygiene. Initially, like all of us have done, it started with just washing hands and other things. But we moved quite fast into it on the PPEs and requirements. It was a big journey. In fact, uh, just want to tell you that, you know, we have the OTA, since we are known in the MEP field, we have got the other phase of it. We have got an FM division, which is, uh, we have got 1,000 plus uh, technicians in various hospitals and ad hoc and uh, gastro kind of situations in UAE and elsewhere. Well. So that was a big challenge. While we had an option of coming out during the COVID, okay, there is a uh, threat to the staff or workers, we did not go because we have served these customers for a long time and the customers were nice to us. So mm -hmm. we have to continue to serve. But that was a big realization that uh, we could understand that our technicians plays more or less an equal role like a nurse or a doctor in these locations. Because we found out that some of the maintenance activities which we are doing to the operation theater or the critical care unit, ICUs, ventilators, etc., are so important. So we have to retain our people. Of course, I don't want to hide the fact that we had impact of COVID. Initially, it came in single number. Then suddenly, one day, it came in uh, double digit. We were all scared. But that CFT, what we found, actually gave us enough experience in controlling, calming down people, putting things done. So we could continue to serve. Uh, we spoke to the government authorities. We spoke to the hospital CEOs. So they also supported us. And I will tell you, this is a clear exhibition of collaboration between the client, the end user, contractor, and the operating agencies. So we could work together well in understanding it. And most important issue, what we have taken care of, thanks to the earlier SARS issue, we ensured that the staff and workmen were given a lot of talk. They were given a lot of advices. So they took it properly. They took it very seriously. They worked in, they actually supported us. They, it's not that you, know, you instruct somebody to go and work. They actually took it very seriously. They served each of these customers. And one thing which I can tell you is that uh, while there are impacts, the projects probably what we first had was 
all critical projects like the district cooling plant, the expo, uh, uh, the convention exhibition centers, etc. So we could continue to work. While the clients, see, one thing very important in this uh, COVID-19 scenario, both mm -hmm. clients, contractor, even consultants, PMCs, everybody was new to this problem. So you can't ask uh, anybody for uh, any kind of help at that particular point of time. So each one of us have to come out with that. Let me thank each one of my stakeholders, clients, consultants, PMs, etc. They all stood with us in this kind of time. We had issues. We had issues because we were told you can't transport 60 workers in a 66 seat of us. We have to told you have to lose it to 25. Your workers cannot start at uh, 6 o'clock. They have to start at 6.30. So all these kind of challenges happen. But we worked out, worked out every kind of problem statement. We found out a solution. The team worked together and they could come out with that. And the whole COVID, I would tell you, uh, apart from we are coming out of the crisis or we are facing the crisis, the most important issue is it is actually teaching the organizations, which are each one of the individual as an organization, but a lot of things we have learned how to work effectively. See, the very fact that today we are all digitally connected and we are addressing a uh, gathering of probably 200, 300 plus people itself shows that the communication is possible. So that actually helped us in taking this uh, crisis out of our agenda, rather being friendly with the crisis and start uh, looking forward. Uh, definitely there are other uh, things which have been done, but of course uh, these I think almost all the companies have done to come out of it. Indeed, indeed. Thank you. Thank you for that, Suresh. Uh, that was very insightful. You've been in the eye of the storm, so to speak, so you've experienced it and that was insightful. Uh, just a couple of follow-up questions from that is, uh, you know, while big organizations such as Volpass have coped with it, working with the bigger uh, main contractors and and and, uh, and and clients, there have been smaller players. You know, I'd be particularly interested in hearing about how the supply chain, including the smaller subcontractors and smaller players, have coped with this challenge. Um, would, would one of the other panelists like to take this up, please? Well, in a recent uh, survey or poll by uh, PwC, they um, they identified the most affected uh, uh, companies by, by COVID-19 are the middle market, so the top contractors, uh, the ones in, the, in, in between, basically. Uh, and I think uh, one of the most interesting uh, takes out of that survey was that uh, they said for the long term, mm -hmm. um, uh, recovery of the industry, there are two vital things that need to be taken by everyone collectively. The first one is obviously keeping the workers healthy, the safety of uh, and the well-being of the workers. And the second thing is ensuring that uh, the uh, statements, the balance statements of the middle market companies remain healthy. Otherwise, we will be free of uh, buying out the middle uh, market and subcontractors, which will affect the market. Pedro, would you like to comment on that, please? Sure, uh, I'll give my, my take on it. Uh, I, I agree, I think safety is paramount. Uh, absolutely echoing Omnia's words, it's, it's super and, and Mr. Suresh. Um, my experience with some of small firms, we deal with a lot of uh, small practice of architects and, and we have and a lot of mm -hmm. subconsultancy. So we are within the subconsultancy consultancy for, uh, sphere. It is very interesting because it's one of the, where you have uh, relationships, established relationships with your clients, there's still work to be done work that hasn't stopped because of COVID uh, or, or the necessity of work hasn't stopped. But clients are are more wary or more cautious in how they spend money. So there's, there's more onerous or of showing value to clients, of supporting your clients. Mm -hmm. um, in my experience, the smaller companies that have those strong clients and they have ongoing projects are still doing okay. The, 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 and, and, and to a certain extent, the bigger companies that have employed thousands of people's, people there as a company are still doing fine or doing okay, but a lot of those employees are doing less okay because the, the, a lot of the work that used to support them is no longer there. So it is a very interesting place. Uh, also in terms of the pandemic and our experience with it is our first, we have an office in Hong Kong that was the, the first office that that suffered from the, the pandemic and everyone were learning 
uh, how are we going to deal with it? This, this pandemic, uh, I think, has far-reaching impact. Uh, the construction industry has had to evolve over the years, <clears throat> and so has the MAP industry in terms of the newer challenges, uh, innovation, etc. But this particularly is an accelerating a need. You see that the business model for the future of construction in the industry being quite different from what, what it is today. I think, uh, um, I think yeah. the transformation is definitely something that we can see more of, uh, and probably a move towards uh, leaner operations, and, uh, more collaborations in the market uh, in a nutshell. And this is what I speak about, the industry will be affected. Suresh, I'm sure you have talked about it. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think, you know, the, the future, uh, see this COVID, uh, as I was continuing what I said, like uh, the COVID actually taught us there are um, there are a lot of opportunities which probably we were not using it. Imagine all these digital uh, solutions, connectivity, all were existing in the past. But for various reasons, we were not using it. We all thought that you know, we could sit across the table to discuss. We never thought that you know, we can do all these things. And those precious 45 minutes, one hour we travel every day, morning and evening, can be used for something else. So uh, the going forward, one, of course, with the, the digitization, because I don't want to call the word as digitalization, the connectivity. The communication and the connectivity is going to be one of the major issues, which will continue to work. Apart from that, there are a lot of uh, changes which will happen in MVP in terms of volumetric construction which off-site fabrication, prefabrication, and even smart fabrication. I call it a smart fabrication because going forward, you will find that the skill availability in this market is going to be a big challenge, which is already a challenge today. With the COVID, what is happening is the world around, there is a reluctance for the workers, the blue-collar workers, to come and work. I can easily send this because uh, like Rata said, I'm, I'm an IOB, I mean, uh, the IOB storm. When we are sitting in, in the middle of issues, we know that these blue collar workers and a lot of technical engineers. See, today the MEPP has got a lot of senior people with a lot of experience, tremendous experience. They are backing up this industry. For various reasons, they can't fly into this place. People are about 60. There are health reasons. Whatever has happened in Western Europe taught us a big lesson. So they will be reluctant to come. Similarly, in the blue collar, we'll have lack of labor. So all these things together, the industry will now start making a revolution. So far, unfortunately, construction industry in particular, or MEP in particular, never had a major automation or major uh, qualitative change in our way of working. That will happen now you will see more and more products which are from shelf to site. I call it a shelf to site means there is a little modification that we require at site. So these kind of evolution will take place. I wish, if you ask me what is my wish, I wish that today this industry has to go back to the university solutions which will reduce the dependency of the, 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 the requirement which is, uh, from the technology side and at the same time reducing the dependency on the skill level. Indeed, you touch on an extremely important point there, Suresh. You know, with all the talk about digitalization and automation and AI and, and, and so on and so forth, I think the most critical element in construction, as with many, many other things in our lives, remains the human element, the intellect, the intelligence that we are able to bring to projects. Uh, if nothing else, what I think this crisis clearly brings to the front is the need for upskilling the, 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 the talent within the MEP industry. I think people is an important point, and I think there's got to be a mind shift in how these people are trained like you said, go back to the universities and start working with people from that level. Uh, that's a very interesting point you touch on. Um, Martin, Pedro, hope we can hear you now. Uh, Martin, can I, can I request you your thoughts on this whole thing about how the construction industry model uh, needs to change and will most probably change because of what's happened. 
So yes, Pedro, exactly. We need to start at that age. <laughs> okay, so I, I think before me, or before, I, I'm 40 years old. So when I started, I still had the privilege of working with, with a gentleman that showed me a, a folder this thick with all the heat loss calculations for, for, um, for a hospital. Right, and I, okay, how long does it take you to do that? Three months, and I thought, my God, there was a time in play, there was a play, a time where taking three months to do a heat loss calculation is it was the norm, it was absolutely accepted. And but now things are moving so rapidly, and, and the change is so immense that it, it's it's we are able, I think it's more the industry are able to attract better, better people. Uh, and it's no longer boring to be a, a building services engineer. You know, there's with so many moving parts and so many interesting systems and so many interesting software and, and alternatives. It just, you then have to have a more um, creative mind to put it all together. I, I agree that I don't think we'll be replaced by AI or machine learning anytime soon. Will we be replaced or not is a different question. But anytime soon, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing it wouldn't happen. Um, in terms of the, the this pandemic and what this pandemic is doing, I think is more training the my generation and the generation above mine than actually the young generation. Because suddenly we are brought into the video conferencing. We're brought into work sharing. We're working in, in collaborative modes and all these sort of things that are not necessarily new to us. Uh, but the platforms certainly are new to us. They are second nature to the people that I'm working, to the graduates that are coming out of university. So, and they are showing us all these wonderful things. So yeah, that, that would be my approach. I think the industry is upskilling. It needs to upskill, you know, the buildings like, the, the beautiful buildings we're building for the expo, the beautiful buildings we have in Sheikh Zayed Road, do not manage themselves. They're not, this, it's like, I think the best analogy someone asked me, uh, someone told me was, you know, if your client is buying a Ferrari, he, he knows it's a complicated car. He needs to maintain it by someone that knows the Ferrari. And I think our buildings are getting to that uh, level of sophistication. Don't be my. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Martin, uh, we'll be very happy to hear from you. Just shut up when, uh, and then if we hear you, we'll be, uh, come and talk with you. Meanwhile, Omnia. Uh, just shifting gears a bit, a specific question. What role do you think the MEP and HVAC industry specifically have to play in the future in terms of prevention of an outbreak like, like, like COVID-19? Well, I think the first, the first part is that our cities were exposed, right? The resilience of our cities was definitely exposed. Um, we have seen uh, cities being reactive rather than proactive, which we do not want to see. Uh, normally, when we design resilience for cities, uh, we would like uh, preparation to be in place so, so that uh, the recovery, uh, so, uh, actually uh, overcoming the crisis, happens okay. while the leaders look into post recovery, the rapid recovery of post crisis. Uh, going on a buildings uh, level, um, maybe we can look at that into the phases of the building, uh, starting with design. Uh, I'd say that the cloud collaboration tools were mature enough uh, so that it enabled the design and, uh, and the continuation of work from that aspect. Uh, but uh, what advancements we will be seeing? Uh, will we be seeing more uh, requirements for computational uh, fluid dynamic models, for example, to uh, show how the air moves within buildings? Will we see uh, the uh, touchless uh, elevators or uh, voice-enabled uh, doors and, and elevators and sanitary wear? Those are quite common. Will they be a requirement going forward? Uh, HVAC systems specifically, uh, the design of that, I know that's a big uh, topic that everyone is thinking about, how HVAC is affecting the, the spread of the disease. So will we see changes in design, maybe an increased use of tilt beams, for example, as opposed to air handling units? Uh, air barriers, uh, increased ventilation rates, or different uh, ways for ventilation. Uh, then moving to the construction, and by construction I mean the actual phase of constructing the building. I think Suresh put uh, a lot on that, uh, and uh, I agree that in, in, I don't see that we did not show a lot of resilience or advancement in that. Uh, there's a lot of reliance on the manpower, and that was affected uh, badly. So will we be seeing advanced techniques like maybe robotics uh, used in construction or uh, uh, more appreciation towards cognitive construction and uh, um, 3D printing, for example? 
Um, will we be seeing more use of drone for project management and supervision? Uh, and of course, there's the contractual trend, which is uh, something that's a big topic uh, regarding health and safety for the major, How will this all be changed uh, moving forward? Uh, then moving to operation, which I think is the phase that affects each and every person on earth, everyone thinking, uh, am I sitting in an air conditioned space? So does AC uh, uh, help with the disease? Is there is the disease airborne? Is it not? Is the recirculation of air affecting uh, the risk? Is it increasing? The risk? Uh, standardization organizations have been taking that. Uh, Eurovent and ASHRI have been releasing statements, uh, and uh, ASHRI specifically, if I talk about them, um, the statement was uh, twofold. Uh, the first one was that if the uh, virus is airborne, then mm -hmm. HVAC can reduce the concentration of the virus in the, in the air, which helps. Uh, so gets us to the second one, if they are quite not to drop your HVAC, do not to drop the ventilation. Uh, in fact, uh, poor air quality within uh, buildings would uh, negatively affect the human's uh, ability to resist infection. Uh, they issued uh, some measures that uh, needs to be taken, in, whether in residential or in commercial buildings. And there's actually a training uh, after two weeks on uh, reoccupation in buildings post the lockdown. Uh, by Ashray, uh, Yunus, my co-founder at Griffin, is one of the trainers, so I advise uh, everyone to take that if you're interested in uh, knowing Ashray's recommendation for the post-COVID uh, uh, occupation of buildings. Um, there's one thing that I hope caught the attention of owner, uh, which is uh, how buildings are being operated, the BMS specifically. I don't think anyone would be surprised if I say that I comfortably say 80% of the buildings that we visit uh, are do not have operational BMS. So they rely heavily on uh, man uh, man operations, and uh, this is definitely an area where it needs a lot of advancement and intervention. Uh, maybe the use of uh, artificial intelligence. We haven't been using that uh, effectively as other industries or other sectors. Um, uh, that's it, I think. That's, uh, that covers the whole, let's say, cycle, life cycle of the building. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Omnia, for that. Uh, Suresh, I think there are some interesting insights there from comments there from Omnia. Would you like to uh, pick on the fact that what does, does uh, apart from new MEP installations, uh, maintenance of constructed buildings as well, there's possibly some innovations, some products, some services that you're thinking about in terms of should go towards uh, enhancing the well being of the residents of the building. Uh, would you like to comment on that, please? Yeah, yeah. See, in fact, uh, from our own experience, and, uh, like uh, we have got is the facility management business, where you know we work very closely with customers in terms of improving the, uh, the indoor air quality and the not only the indoor air quality. We work on water services, uh, recover your water, etc. But I just want to add some points to it from your observation that it's not only a MEP. Actually, what we need is an integrated approach in terms of with the architect itself. Because going forward, you need building itself has need to be designed to prevent such infections in the future. So you need there, there are you know like an air-conditioning engineer can do a lot of good things. There are a lot of ashtray standards, and these organizations are really one wonderful job they are doing it. But they need to be supported by the architect community. The building community, the builder community, the developers, they have to provide certain old area, these equipments. See, now going forward, see, for example, uh, like Petros, in the other days, we used to do the hospital designs, where we used to ensure that the equipments are always serviced from outside, not technician goes inside. Going forward, even in the residential buildings or commercial buildings, this is going to be a kind of a design requirement which is going to come. So mm -hmm. you need less and less uh, human touch. So there are a lot of automation. You have the parts, the water pockets will be all uh, contactless. Even the door handles need to be replaced. Probably you will just walk with your identity card, and uh, the door, I mean, the, the door contacts can identify you and allow you to enter. It automatically opens and closes. So all these issues are going to take place in this area. But facility management, water, all these issues something which I think the clients have to seriously have a look at. 
look at professionalizing things to do it, rather than just get one plumber and one electrician to take care of your building. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that, Suresh. Uh, can I just say to the audience listening in, uh, again, it's an opportunity for you to pose some questions or uh, you know, offer your comments to the panelists on this particular topic. So feel free to uh, write in your questions in the chat box uh, while we continue this discussion. Um, one question, uh, you know, you all touched upon, it's not just any HVAC, but, you know, all other players within the construction needing to construction freely needing to collaborate and cooperate so do you really envision better cooperation between firms of all sectors post this this pandemic towards uh, you know uh, improving the environment making uh, a constructed product better for the future do you see this collaboration happening can you hear me oh yeah yes indeed martin yes Good, sorry, I've been having all sorts of technical issues. Can you just repeat the question? So, um, you know, we, the panelists have talked about the need, the, the important role that HVAC and MEP have to play in terms of, uh, you know, helping with the prevention of a future disease outbreak and also in terms of, uh, you know, having a better product from all points of view, green, energy efficient, etc. The question is, it's not just the HVAC and MEP industry, but players across sectors needing to collaborate and work together on this objective. Do you see improved and better collaboration happening in the coming days between players in the different sectors? Uh, it would be favorable to all of us if this could happen for sure. Uh, and there is a hope that it that will. Um, there's There's been a bunch of uh, impediments uh, to this really truly happening in the right way uh, in, in the past and mostly that's because of the way projects are procured what fundamentally would help so of course we wait for uh, the others to come back and maybe you want to comment on that please uh, i think that for for the the industry uh, for this collaboration to take effect properly we really need uh, you know a, 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 an appropriate amount of time that design-related issues are properly considered and research where needed is undertaken so that so that optimal solutions can be advanced for incorporation into the design, uh, considering the relative expertise of design contributors, stakeholders, uh, and operational asset management of facilities themselves. Looking ahead, prefabrication modular assemblies of building elements created th uh, through D 3D digital printing will also necessitate a greater level of collaboration and integration of the supply chain than ever before. And so this is a big challenge for, for all of us uh, who are operating in the industry. But the right platform for all of this to happen is, uh, in my view, uh, a, a reassessment uh, by clients in the way that they procure their projects. All right, I think you, you've touched on an important point in terms of prefabrication and off-site work. I think uh, each of you touched on it, but I think we'll delve a little more into it. Uh, there's a real opportunity here in terms of reducing the density of the workforce on the project sites, better quality, <clears throat> uh, improved finishes, uh, etc. by the whole concept of prefab or off-site fabrication and bringing a product to the, to the site for installation, like Suresh said, just making a few modifications there. I think it's worth spending a few minutes uh, going into a little more detail on to what extent they have come here in this part of the world in terms of off-site and prefab, and where do we see the industry going? Uh, again, uh, Suresh, being from the construction industry, maybe you want to take the lead on that. Uh, yeah, in fact, Pradhaka, the uh, prefab has actually become uh, order of the day today. A lot of contractors today are going for it and uh, that trend is coming up but what is more important here is uh, all these stakeholders you touched one very important point all the stakeholders coming together understanding that yes this is what exactly i'm going to do the architect the consultant pmc the interior decorator everybody has to work together because you need an integrated design for a uh, modular see while modular actually takes away a lot of labor from site it also has got certain restrictions. You can't do too much of modifications at site, or you can't make zero modifications at site. 
So the modular is going to be the authority. Now we have to grow much beyond that current tendency. Today we are doing only modular for the corridor, uh, the, the dust rooms or the theaters, etc. We have to go for the plant rooms. We have to go for the channels. So the going forward, it will be how much percentage you can modularize in the building. Today, in my opinion, the modularization is in the range of about 20 to 30 percent in the construction buildings. This has to go to reach the numbers of 70 to 75 percent. If that reaches, then there will be a substantial reduction of numbers of workers at site, higher quality, modularizing the project. The project will become a field construction to a manufacturing mode. That's what exactly I, I would recommend. I think, right, I, think right. I think as a consultant, you'll have uh, more ideas about, uh, I think, uh, prefab is not new to the world. There are a lot of other countries that are moving it. I think we, we, in our last conversation with the client on prefab, th that point uh, was on the table. It was very prevalent. Oh, but then I have, there's changes that need to happen and it's quite difficult to, uh, to accommodate them. I think that's, that's that is a very fair point, but it's not the approach. The approach is there should be no changes to be done. And changes come in all shapes and forms. Some of them are client-driven. Some of them are coordinations that are, are not done to the level of the detail they should have by the consultants. I think in why the projects, in projects where we are utilizing BIM and Revit and all these sort of elements. And to Martin's point, there is a there needs to be a shift on we have this very we, we first do some color coding and then we do something else and then we do the schematic and then we do detail design is only at the end. In prefabrication, you can't really behave in that way because the gentleman needs to be prefabricating the, the plant room as you uh, alluded to Suresh in the beginning. So there is a different uh, way of thinking. I do believe that the, the, the tools are now mature enough and the, the business and, and the market is getting mature enough to, to have a better experience with prefabrication. In prefabrication, it is it is a standard in a lot of places. And if you go to places like Japan, a prefabricated house, everyone wants a prefabricated house because invariably they're better quality than a house that you built on site. So that's the sort of experience that we want, hopefully, to deliver to our clients in the future going forward. Right. <clears throat> Okay, thank you for that, uh, Pedro. Um, Omnia, do you see any issues uh, from where you sit in terms of quality, coordination uh, to be had in mind when you consider more and more off-site and pre plant and modeler systems? Um, look, we've, we've had a project that was initially going as a prefab on all MEP systems. That mm -hmm. eventually uh, did not continue. Uh, it went only prefab on the HVAC. Uh, because of the issues that Pedro mentioned. So there were a lot of changes from the, uh, on the design and, uh, and not all, uh, let's say, uh, parties that were uh, involved in the project were at the same level when it comes to BIM and 3D and getting uh, the design itself uh, relatively prefabricated. So there are a lot of um, gaps within the market that need to be filled before we get into complete prefabrication. But is it possible? Yes, it is, it is possible. Are there players that can ensure this to happen? Yes, there are. Right. Um, Suresh, to the challenges that Omnia mentions with the particular project, and I think uh, we, we've seen that issue crop up in other projects as well. What can the, the contractor do in terms of avoiding these uh, issues of coordination, uh, clashes, etc.? happening on site. I know BIM is a topic that you kind of uh, swing in different ways in terms of seeing, thinking it's a good thing or maybe it's not developed enough yet for us to use. Maybe that has a hand to play. Any comment on that, please? Uh, see, uh, BIM actually, BIM, well, BIM is with us for the last few years. But let me admit that this uh, industry has not really adopted BIM in totality. It's in isolated pockets. The architectural guy does it. Uh, the MEP will do some of the uh, maybe the steel fabricated dust, but the integrated model is still not evolving it. Because what's happening in every project, you have got a architectural consultant, you've got a structural consultant, aluminum consultant, you've got an MEP consultant. 
then you have got different packages given to various people and you expect a general contractor uh, who is more of uh, uh, the structural or an architectural guy to do an integration so there what happened everybody has to work on a single model when everybody has to work on a single model that means there is hell a lot of investment required lot of coordination required you have to keep all your egos out and work on a single model then it is very effective that's not happening my experience with several projects then is yet to take a real advantage in this particular market i fully agree with omnia that lot of industries lot of projects unfortunately prefab is not getting effective because the interdisciplinary coordination is not happening you have to buy everybody has to buy so uh, i will rather you know i was uh, heard a kind of uh, philosophy used by the md of alag he said you know the project is like a fish pond uh, you know it's a fish tank the owner owns the fish tank now he has to put the right kind of fishes in the uh, in the uh, tank you cannot put uh, some fancy fishes and a shark inside so you have to put the proper combination of consultant contractor subcontractor then everybody will work together and everybody should be taken into one common objective once that common objective happens all these coordination issues will start finding solutions and items like prefab automation offsite fabrication everything will come to the front line and we will be in a position to do it but, but suresh to, to your point just a, a, a quick one the coordination needs to happen the coordination will happen eventually and more time uh, nine times out of 10 happens when someone is you're with a helmet and someone is looking at a drawing saying your drawing doesn't work you know and that that's a, a, a terrible experience as a consultant so i remember when i arrived in this country in dubai 4 years ago i was having exactly the same conversations with two different teams but one of them i had a client saying you you're costing me a lot of money and the other the, the other was in a virtual environment and and it was calm and relaxed and we were able to solve it so yeah so i think it's not that coordination will uh, by, by the nature of what we do always will need to happen it's just choosing the right time and giving it the right time at the right process to ensure that we have a much better experience when we're building our our buildings uh, pedro i see what the like construction man earlier when i was in that field i used to tell people the people inside should not be allowed to use the brain they have to just build so they should have a drawing in hand which is builder so if you allow the people with the helmet to start controlling coordination at site that doesn't work so you have to have see we have got so many engineering staff if you look at the project cost your worker cost and staff cost is almost equal so all the high paid people are in the engineering site so you should ensure that they coordinate it well they even it has to be see that's where i told earlier that culture has to change this has to be like a factory the people in the field has to build it I agree it needs to be like as, as as clean as i can you have a set of plans you follow you have another you know, bolt one goes there bolt two goes there you just follow it that's it yeah absolutely industrialization and 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 offsite fabrication exactly key. exactly Uh, if I if I can add, uh, I think the success of BIM uh, depends on as well. Uh, if I if I say two things, is the first one is the capability of whoever is using it and all the parties involved, and uh, the willingness or having a client who is insisting and believing in the uh, in the uh, value that BIM would bring them. Uh, this is the client is at the end of the day the driver. If he wants BIM, it should happen. is it is it possible yes and we have been involved in projects that were successful uh, throughout uh, construction utilizing them uh, i think uh, one of the shortfalls are actually using them in construction so we do not see them being used in operations while you have a 3d full uh, model that has all the info that you would need we still go into buildings uh, as we are involved in a lot of existing building audits and uh, assessments Uh, you go and you see the traditional uh, folders after folders and hundreds and papers that are sometimes uh, not something that were never touched they're full of dust uh, so if clients actually 
uh, are educated and see the uh, benefit of having that them being used throughout the life cycle of the projects for operations, I think this would be a major push to the adoption of them in the industry. But also say that it's part of us. You know, internally we've decided, regardless if the client wants it or not, we're doing in Revit, because we believe that the output is a better output. It even protects us better, because we can sure we can. You know, the 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 days of me going to an architect and say I need 800 mil, and they're saying do it, do a sketch, prove it to me, prove it. You know, th that conversation no longer happens because it's clear. So there, there's also a, an element. Yes, clients are super keen to. to, to to get the most out of it. But as an industry, we should also be saying, if we believe this is the best tool, let's train everyone on it and let's just, just use it. We do the same, Pedro, we use it, but uh, does that model get used eventually by the contractors and constructors? And the clients That's a different knowledge? issue, isn't it? Is who owns the model and when? And, and then, uh, because, Suresh is going to grab my model and he's going to create his own model, which is detailed to a, to a different level. And then he owns that model and how that model is then reflects the final installation and how that model is then communicated to the client. It's a very interesting topic and it's not very, very clear, but there's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, I think it's another hour conversation to get, to get to that, but you're absolutely right. It's, it's a lost opportunity. Yeah, I think it's a very, very interesting topic and I think we picked it up towards the end of our session but uh, Martin we definitely like to hear your your view on this uh, piece. Yeah if you can hear me. Yes please. Yes uh, I mean yes. this is uh, what I was uh, alluding to earlier about uh, the way in which projects are, are commissioned uh, where we have a fractious uh, arrangement at the present time where uh, different entities are, are participating at different times in the project. So the collaboration which is necessary uh, to take full advantage of modularization and prefabrication isn't capable of being undertaken when we only have the, the design uh, consultants on board at that time without any contracting entity. And then when the contracting entity takes over, you know, the, the design team has stepped back. And so there's therefore, there's also not the participation between the design team, the contractor, and indeed the end user uh, for post occupancy and facilities management. So it's a, it, uh, that's the misfortune that we currently sit with in, in the way projects are procured in this region, but not exclusively in this region. Uh, you know, elsewhere, you, uh, my own experience uh, across different markets and different sectors. Um, th there are different things that come into play elsewhere, but still, we still have impediments and, and uh, hurdles in which we have to get over. Uh, in, for example, the rail sector or the aviation sector, this is starting to get a little bit different in other parts of the world and the contractors and the designer uh, and indeed the facility teams are all present at various points where they can collaborate in a proper way and this is something that would obviously I mean it is to state the obvious this would help us uh, for, for every sector and every uh, every territory but we are where we are indeed indeed in fact it's the same word construction contracting collaboration cooperation etc and, and then with that another c word we are facing a crisis the pandemic is a crisis but like the chinese saying goes with every crisis there is an opportunity as well so thank you very very much uh, to all of you for that wonderful uh, con conversation your insights and your expertise that you shared with all of us uh, thank you for making the time to be with us this morning and offering your, your experience and insights thank you again uh, Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, I'm going to welcome the panelists for the next session to join us here. We are going to pick up a very interesting third topic, very topical, very relevant, and again, possibly brought forward with uh, even more acceleration given the situation that we have faced today, transitioning towards a digitalized future. So uh, let me welcome the panelists as they come on. Uh, Mahmoud Hamid, Senior Engineering Consultant Ramball, in addition to his role uh, as a Senior Engineering Consultant. He is also the Chairman of Employees Works Council for Ramball's Middle East region, where he serves as a liaison between employees and management to discuss critical operational issues and employee engagement. 
In 2019, Mahmood was named winner of the MEP Young Engineer Award for the Middle East. Very impressive indeed, Mahmood. Thank you. And next uh, with us is Nicholas Pijinski. I hope I've said your name right. Yeah. And uh, the VP Director, WME, with the movies experience in the Middle East. And Nicholas has responsibility for the management and delivery of the MEP team at WME, focusing on technical excellence in design and energy efficient building services. Then we have Paul Wallet join in. Paul is Regional Area Director with Trimble. Paul is a 32 year industry veteran both in the construction side directly and also with services that are uh, provided to construction industry. And uh, we then have Gumit Nanda, who is head of operations for Voltas Limited in the UAE. In one of his assignments, uh, he was a construction manager for a seven-star hospital project. Interestingly, in addition to your MEP industry experience, uh, Gumit, you started and headed the modular MEP prefabrication division for Voltas. This was a very interesting topic of discussion in the previous uh, session and very, very relevant for the current world. And we should be also having with us Reed Donovan, technical director for the firm. There you see him. He has research and leadership of the MEP business across the Middle East region. And you have real experience of working for major design consultancies, including Arcadis, WSP, Arup, Bureau Hapol, and WS Arcade. So your insight will be very, very helpful. According to a PWC survey, which was published by the NEP magazine in January 20, just before the COVID-19 outbreak, 78% of the Middle East private businesses acknowledged that digitalization will impact the long-term viability of their business. The same article said downturns often bring opportunities and companies that prepare early and advance rather than retreat can benefit enormously during difficult times and beyond. Companies that see digital transformation as the key to unlocking the next stage of growth and get the implementation right have a fighting chance of growing faster with the next after the problem. That could have, couldn't have been more uh, correct in terms of the time that we are created with. But I think it was very, very appropriate that we saw this article in January. So with that said, let me start uh, with a question to the panel. Uh, is it fair to say that COVID-19 has reignited discussions about digitalization? Can I, can I direct that question at you, Paul? To start with. Just on mute. Um, yeah, um, obviously, you know, moving into this whole scenario, I think it's it certainly has. And, you know, when we look at all the, the different webinars now that we're having about this subject, um, it, it certainly shows that the discussion about around digitization and what we need to be doing in the industry to improve. Um, has, has certainly changed. Um, the McKinsey came out with a, a, a very nice uh, survey on digital construction. Um, and what they uh, surveyed or, or their opinion is that it, over the last, let's say now, 12 weeks of mm -hmm. uh, the pandemic, the uh, adoption or let's say the, the industry has literally jumped forward around five years in, in uh, their approach to digitization. Um, what, what we've noticed um, when we look at uh, the people that are starting to uh, download different cloud sharing services and models and um, our different technologies. So when we have people that went straight to a lockdown scenario, the first thing is they needed to continue their operations. Um, and, you know, for many of us, it was uh, all of a sudden, one day we're in the office, the next day, you know, we're all working from home. Uh, so there was a big uh, surgence of people wanting to use these cloud sharing services, like the model sharing or our product Trimble Connect, uh, to enable them to continue their business. 
Um, when we look at um, some of the solutions that we have in terms of uh, the product uh, upload. So we have warehouses where people will download and upload uh, their di different manufacturing contents. That increased dramatically. And we saw uh, in excess of you know, 30, 30 odd percent increases in people uploading information, manufacturing uh, companies uploading their uh, components into the cloud, uh, and as well about 50% download of that data. Um, so certainly, you know, this whole scenario has, has really changed the way that we have to think about digitization. I think what we did find prior to that, conversations have always been going on, I would say, for the last 10 years, you know, when building information modeling became the topic of the day, and we've been talking about that for a number of years now. Um, however, I think there was always a, an inherent resistance uh, for the majority. You know, they saw it as a big investment. And then you're also dealing with uh, the social dynamics. You know, people in the organization that knew it was available, that didn't want to really take the time to invest. Now they've been launched forward where, you know, they really have no choice but to uh, invest. And once they started to do that, they saw the value of of deploying digital tools. Right, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, Paul, would any of the rest of you want to add to what Paul said there to that question? Similar to Paul, uh, the lockdown happened quite quickly. Uh, office with a thousand people in, went you know, from a thousand people in an office to no one's allowed back tomorrow was a, was a massive challenge. Um, within a week, about a week in total to get ourselves organized from, from a project perspective it was quite straightforward because we shift, we'd already shifted all our projects to bim 360 so that it was all cloud-based anyway there was nothing on the server so we could all work from any location and access the modeling the models and all the other information on the project uh, and then we also went further we realized that we're going to have to use you know Platforms. It's MS Teams for uh, holding what would normally be a face-to-face -face workshop or general interaction with our staff. So we, so we expanded the use of MS Teams and we replicated all the folder structures and projects onto MS Teams. So what, what it meant was is not only not only was all the modeling done in the cloud, access through the cloud, we could all access it and share, mm -hmm. all the other projects project data was all accessed freely at MS Teams. I wasn't aware at the start of this project we could do that on MS Teams. It's quite powerful. And it's been working very well since. And we're still using the same platforms now, even though we've got approximately 30% of our staff back into our offices. So it's 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 completely changed the way that we operate uh, in a very short space of time. Right. Thank you, Nick, did you want to add to that? Did you want to say something? Um, yeah, I will. I mean, to be honest, actually, <laughs> Reed said a lot of what I was going to say because within WME, we followed a very similar path. What we actually found was that the tools that we already had, uh, we were using Teams to work with our colleagues in other offices around the world. We were using BIM 360 to work with other architects and work with ourselves. We had all of these tools and we were scratching the surface of what was possible. And then, as Reed said, one day we're in the office and the next day we're not anymore. So the first thing we did is we looked at what, what we had, what are we already doing and how can we change the way we operate with the things that we have to hand. And, and actually what we found was there was so much power in things that were already available to us. All we needed to do was just embrace them more. We had everything we needed. Um, I think in consultancy, I, I felt that because a lot of consultants in the UAE already work with other elements of their own organization in other parts of the world, we actually had a bit of an advantage over some other industries and some other parts of our own industry because we were used to working remotely with people. I found actually that some of the clients we dealt with were the least organized when it came to doing remote working, to setting up remote meetings, but they've never had to do that before. They just expect everybody to come to them, whereas we already 
had that mindset and so we had some of those tools to kind of put in place so i think th this process really has shown that actually we need to do more with what we already have you know and then we can start thinking about new and bright ideas but we've got a way to go before we're pushing the boundaries of, of, of tools that everybody uses day to day yeah and indeed i think we need to do a lot more than what we've been doing what is it that has held the industry back uh, gumi you come from the uh, the contractor uh, uh, side of the equation right. it has held uh, the industry back from you know pushing ahead with digitalization what been holding the industry back yeah see uh, if you look at the construction industry in general not only in middle east but worldwide if you look at it it has been a laggard for the last 2 3 decades in adopting new technology and changes uh, there was a study interestingly done by mckinsey a few years back in which all the industries were listed uh, which have adopted technology in the last 2 3 decades and construction happened to be at the second bottom so the only industry which was below bottom uh, below construction was mining so that gives you an idea how far we have been adopting technology so there's a big room for improvement there the reasons if you ask me according to me why it has been held back i see three major reasons there one is to do with the people when i say people within people also three primary reasons one being the incumbents who are there they have they feel that they have been doing the operations for the last 20 30 experience 20 30 years and this is the way they want to do so there is a resistance to change them they do not want to change they want to continue in the way they have been doing the business second the people aspect would be the talent if you see the the new people coming out of new colleges post graduates people are coming they might not be attracted towards the construction industry it could be a chicken and egg story if you see they are you know they want to go to microprocessors nanotechnology quantum technology those are the fields where they want to work because construction has been so you know low tech industry they do not want to come there but having said that there is an opportunity for here in construction to improve that is the second aspect to it staying on the people front if you look at from the third perspective is the people the consultant body who can bring about the change those people have been too much focused on the manufacturing and the it and those industries if you see the expertise who can bring about the changes we do not find them in the market so as voltas we had a similar experience we wanted to bring a lot of changes when we went to the market there were not many consultants or experts or solutions available then we had to customize which leads leads us into the second aspect of what has held us back the mindset of people looking at technology as a cost we need to change our mindset and start looking at it as an investment if you see you will see as being a contractor you will see a lot of contractors coming into small contractors coming and taking a big projects because there are no entry barriers in the construction industry there's a famous you know portus 5 forces model one of the uh, there's no barrier in construction so anyone can come here and the barrier is not that because people are not investing but we need to realize if we start investment in technology in digital space and prefabrication and automation if we start doing that it would create barriers the company to adapt it and would become eventually more efficient and it would keep out other competitions out of it so that mindset of this being a cost needs to change and we need to think of it as an investment which should actually repay itself and earn money back to us and the third important aspect which i feel which has held it back is the there are multiple stakeholders if you see the developers there are contractors there are consultants there are engineers and primarily everyone would have different objectives so with them their objectives are not aligned which leads us into a situation wherein everyone is looking at different goal developer would want flexibility because if you see a project a project from the conceptual stage and when it is delivered to the end client and the people come in it could be 8 to 10 year gap so they want the technologies would be changing the taste and the design would be changing so developer wants certain degree of flexibility in changing things but you look from contractors point of view or from designers point of view when they are doing it it would mean additional cost but they want the best in the lowest cost so those objectives do not match more so from the technology point of view 
everyone in isolation is adopting technology contractors would have their own thing consultant would have their own but i do not see a lot of standardization a barring you know few things like bim which is there which would be used by architect or could be used by consultants engineers and contractors you would not see many digital tools which are being used you know across the supply chain or the industry and everyone has got different unless that standardization comes into picture and people start working on common platform with common objective and understanding what would be the pain for one if consultant gives a model which is not well done and what the uh, you know contractor would be doing so those things they need to understand and if they work together rather than working in silos i feel it would be a big it would be big uh, improvement and for all, all of us to work together on that i think you set out both the challenges and opportunities very well there gumi uh, thank you for that uh mahmood uh, oh, okay uh, i think mahmood will be with us just in a second um so basically you know we've had a rude awakening a shock of sorts in terms of this pandemic hitting us uh, some of us were better prepared a lot of us were less prepared uh, mahmood um, do you would you agree if i make a statement that uh, you know this this pandemic has in a way of speaking given us a semi clean slate from which we start a fresh discussion about digitalization you know you were asking about the semi clean slate from which the discussions about digitalization um so there has been like great progress um the way i'm seeing it over the past 10 years or so in terms of the workplace and businesses digitizing um what this pandemic has done to ex- is is essentially expedite these conversations but businesses now have to move quicker than ever to meet the digital demand of their clients in some cases we have you know built uh, this you know built on digital initiatives from the past uh, which is making you know which is like things like working from home um investing in it infrastructure and you know doing a continuous improvement to webinars and we're seeing more and more of that now a lot of um you know whether it's suppliers manufacturers or specialists are running their webinars instead of them coming in doing a lunch and learn session um and so that's you know i could see that you know beginning built on uh however you know we have a great deal of initiatives that are coming to life from scratch uh one of those items is bim 360 i think reed has touched upon that quite well um you know because you have clients and other disciplines um as well as architects where they can all you know review and submit drawings online they can go into a cloud system they can provide comments um as well as do submissions which wasn't the case before um you know we've noticed that before it was it was more towards um like an offline type of industry where till today i actually we see some companies that still print drawings for review and work on offline autocads um and honestly that's it, it, where the train is moving and if you don't jump on you're going to be left behind um and now we're seeing revit models um generated bim 360 and you know you could do a lot with those tools that will save you a lot of time um and can be accessed pretty much by everyone in this industry um you know some of those things is a very small example if we want to go a little technical when it comes to esp calculations for an entire system um you know a lot of times you'll see that done in old school fashion but now you could use revit as a tool to generate that for you automatically um within minutes so it's things like that that we can you know take on and improve the offline stream and engagement to making sure that everything is online so yeah Indeed. yeah yeah absolutely now i think it's very critical what we need to do and how we need to move forward now the question is who holds the key to making these important taking these important steps forward is it the incumbent bigger heads in the organization or is it going to be more of the incoming and upcoming talent reach um, can i can that question at you in terms of acom it's is quite straightforward we 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 recognize that we needed to have 
We're going through a digital transformation process. We have been for some time. The COVID situation, as we said a minute ago, has actually accelerated that probably tenfold. Mm -hmm. But we decided as a business that we needed to bring in a, digi a digital director into the business, into the buildings team, to help us bring all these things together. Now, we have that in place. So each uh, MEP, architecture, structures, and all the special services that we provide, all the business leads, I'm the MEP leads, are involved in this. We're all contributing towards that common data what we you know one source of truth or one common data environment for the business it's all about data um you know, we're not we're not drawing we don't do drawings anymore you know we play with data in a model and one of the outputs of that data happens to be a revit model okay so we're completely mm -hmm. transforming the way we think about things and the ultimate goal is is there's like a four-stage process from MEP perspective and that is having a common regimen, consistent workflows, data and tools, um, library standard objects, families, and all the templates, not just for producing models, that includes calculations, everything. And then the idea is, is once we get to the end of that journey and finish all that work, we can then to really get into the automation side of what we're doing. So we've done some tests already whereby if you took a typical office footplate, we we'll devise the data, data entries in there. There's a whole bunch of data that's put into the Revit model, and it automatically populates the model with the content. So it automatically populates the mechanical ventilation system. It automatically populates the lighting layer, the fan core unit location. So this is what we're working towards. Our goal is to be in a, in a, in a position where we are using these tools to their absolute maximum, pushing the boundaries of these tools to get towards automation. Uh, there's a there's a saying that we've sort of come up with between us, and we're trying to eradicate all mundane tasks. So think about that for a second. There's a lots of mundane tasks that we do on a daily basis, whether it's manual calculations, Excel spreadsheets, whatever we use. It's Eradicating all of that and having one common data environment where everything sits, all of our outputs are generated from. Yeah, okay. That was interesting to hear from really in terms of what uh, they with me from what, what they're doing. I would similarly like to hear from the other panelists specific initiatives and efforts that they're making in this area. Can I again start with uh, Paul from Trimble, please? Yeah, um, I'm, I, it was really good to hear you know a, a comma doing um what really what we're looking at is what we deem to be um three pillars or corners of of uh, the whole con if we look at the whole construction process you know from doing the best you can in the design phase uh tying up the supply chain as well and then obviously on the construction but also you know how we relate that digital world into the physical environment is an, another aspect so what we really focus on because you know we're born we, we've been in construction on, on the job sites for the last you know 30 odd years with the different technologies that we have so we understand very well you know the job site and we have a, a very good understanding of the design uh supply chain and, and, and world is is really look at um not just take you know building information modeling as as one terminology, but look at really the whole constructible aspect of of those buildings that you put together. So the whole premise of BIM is obviously to build a well coordinated, federated, and and highly detailed model, um, but then to have enough content and information so that you can actually replicate that out on on the job site as you originally uh, you know created in, in the virtual space. Um, so really the level of development that you build into these models is, is one critical element, element of that. Um, then, then we look at the, um, the content. So as, as stated, you know, we, we're looking at tools that um, you know, are populating, like Reed mentioned about the whole HVAC system, remove those mundane tasks. In any building there are 
thousands and thousands of different manufacturing uh, elements that are put into that. So if we look at a, you know, a main structure, the main structure may take up 30 odd percent of, of the project. Another 30 percent is in the MEP. Um, and there's a tremendous amount of equipment and electrical components. Um, so making sure that you've got the uh, the right manufacturer's product information available that sits on the cloud so everybody can access that. When you put that into the model, it exactly, exactly matches the manufacturer's specification. So, you know, when you model a pipe and you put a bend in it and you do that spooling drawing, it exactly matches how it should be uh, manufactured and, and constructed. Um, so the content is also a, a critical element and a, a key to that. And on the cloud services, you know, we've got millions and millions of these uh, different objects that are sitting there ready for people you know, to download. And, and the other critical element is being connected across the whole supply chain, getting information at any particular time, any day, anywhere you are in the world, tapping into that information, being able to use a platform that you can you know, upload your documentation, you can upload various types of models. The BIM you know, is made up of several different special uh, specialist models as well. You've got different uh, services uploading that. And, and then with all of these three elements, you are in a really good position to be able to go to site and construct. But the final yeah. aspect would be connecting that physical world to the digital. And that's really where I think there is a big, also a big disconnect. So the, the data disconnect is still, you know, we see contractors going to site, very commonplace, they'll go with a, a two-dimensional drawing that they've printed out, and then getting that relationship, okay, well, that's a physical element, this is a 2D drawing element, you've got to have a skilled tradesperson to interpret that drawing to understand how that actually relates. So all of these great tools that are becoming available nowadays with the mixed reality, with the augmented reality, actually taking that digital model and, and projecting that information out into the physical world really helps move the construction and get, get the information flow in, in the right direction. All right, okay. Thank you for that, Paul. That's, that's very insightful. Gumit, if I can turn to you, um, as someone who's responsible for the operations of multiple projects in the country, would you like to uh, touch upon specific initiatives you're taking in uh, the, the digital area for project management, project monitoring, productivity, uh, monitoring and enhancement, maybe these three topics specifically, would you like to touch on, please? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, at Volters, we actually started our digital journey around two years back. So before the COVID came in, we were you know, in a pretty good shape. And some of the things which we have not done, COVID situation has helped us to accelerate those changes. Is there. So coming back to what we have focused on, we have done, like uh, we're saying, from the MEP contractor point of view, if you look at, there were not ready-made solutions which were uh, available for us. And one of the points which Paul was saying, there was, a, there was a disconnect between what we are having in something like BIM and physical work. So those were the challenges which we had. And then we had to look at a construction industry specialist because the construction industry has been a laggard and not many solutions were there. We had to look at adjacent spaces and adjacent industries like manufacturing and automobile and something like uh, IT industry to get solutions for us. What we have focused on is that we had different tools which were working in silos, something for procurement, something for engineering, something was available for construction. We focused on integrating all of them along with the primary program. So all of them speak the same language, they're showing the same reality and they're aligned with each other. If you've got a primary program on how to do the construction, it could take care of whether the design and engineering has been done by it for it. And the essence was also to help us have a real time information. Generally, all these tools would be very good at when at the beginning of the job, you would have Primavera program, wonderful, you know, 10,000 line program, having all the information. But as you go along the project, this would be away from the reality. It would be a disconnect between what has happened on the ground and what was there in the Primavera program. The focus was to integrate the Primavera program along with the engineering, the procurement, and the construction, which would happen on site. 
Now we have tried to make the organization completely paperless. The foremen who would be working on the site, they would not be making a digital, oh, sorry, a paper daily site report. Now they have got tablets. They would know the targets which they need to do on a daily basis. They would enter the installation they would have done on a daily basis. This would basically, some supervisor would authenticate it that they have done that. It would get then populated inside the Primera program. So we have focused a lot on integrated, integrating the EPC and the planning aspect of the job. With that, at any given point of time, we would know what is the real in real time where we are. Otherwise, a lot of time the problems and the issues would come up much later, uh, and you would come to know in, in you know in a reactive way. Then you are doing this helps us in a proactive way to address the issues which we would be or we can foresee uh, which may come up in the future. So this is what has helped us. It, the other aspect to using these tools is that we have started to do more of pay fabrication in, in, in the business. At the engineering stage itself, stage itself, we look at what are the elements which we can prefabricate. Uh, I one of the earlier panel discussions which you were having in which a couple of people talked about prefab. Uh, what we are trying to do is we are trying to maximize the industrialization or manufacturing of the construction works in, in, in an off-site facility. We are aiming to make it towards 30 to 50 percent of off-site for MEP if we can do that. And the digital tools are helping us in a way to make that possible, which also reduces the number of people on this on the slide. It improves the safety, it improves the quality. So these are some of the things which help us. And overall, from a contractor point of view, it helps us to be more efficient and reduce our cost. So this is what our impetus has been, and which obviously helps us to be more productive and you know work towards the objectives. Thank you, thank you, Gumi. Nick, can I uh, can I ask you to answer you know anything specific within your organization that you're taking on accelerating sure. the organization? Yeah. And um, so within WME, we started really seriously looking at digitalization um, around about the midpoint of last year, because um, what we recognized was that we were using Revit and we were saying we were doing digital delivery, but what we were doing is we were producing 3D models, coordinated 3D models, but we knew that there was a lot more that we could do, um, but we didn't actually know what the limits were. We, you know, the, the kind of example I've used is we were in a bubble and we didn't know where the edges of the bubble were in terms of what the capabilities were possible. So the mandate was simply to find out what we were good at and what was possible. And once we started understanding what was possible, we then sort of worked back from that to start setting up um, uh, workflow task forces to incrementally improve our skills, to get us towards the edge of the bubble. We wanted to be the guys that were pushing the boundaries of what was possible, that were contacting Autodesk saying, guys, why can't you add this feature to your software? Or speaking to Trimble and saying, oh, wouldn't it be great if your tools could do this, this, and this? But at the point where we started, we didn't know what the limits were. So we pulled together a team. There was uh, myself, some of the other directors. We pulled in some of the more junior engineers who were really into Revit, who had engineering skills, but also BIM skills, and just started talking, watching YouTube videos, Autodesk University, all of this stuff, to get a whole series of ideas. We then right. put them on the wall, selected five. So I think uh, ESP calculations for fan core units was mentioned. That was the first thing that we did. Um, we've used uh, the MagicAd link for uh, Dialux to automate our calculations for electrical um, for lighting and then pulling them back into Revit. So we really tried to, things, we tried to find things that were achievable, things that we knew we could deliver on. And once we had them, we ran them in parallel on a couple of projects. So for example, one thing we're doing at the moment is we're using Dynamo to pull information from an Excel schedule, essentially a room data sheet into Revit. Revit is then auto producing um, HVAC strategy drawings, it's doing uh, cooling load calculations, it's doing electrical load calculations at a concept level. And so when we get a new Revit model from the architect, we run our Dynamo scripts again, and we've got a new set of drawings. We don't need to spend a week redoing all of our calculations in Excel. So we've done these things in parallel on live projects to the point where we're really comfortable they work within our digital team, at which point we then write a small white paper for the rest of the office and that becomes you know, we then roll it out across the rest of the business so 
we're trying to make sure that at every step of the way we're delivering something we don't want you know um uh, perfect to be the enemy of good we want to make sure that even if we've got big ideas that we're constantly saying well we can do this now so let's use that as a foundation to build on the idea the idea is and i think as, as reed mentioned you know it's eliminating the mundane you know how many years ago was it where if you wanted to do a thousand calculations you had to do them by hand now you can do them in excel and this is the same thing you know it's just using the tools we've got to speed up our work we're in an environment where we're as consultants we're under pressure for time we're under pressure for resource and if we cannot spend time doing the mundane we can spend time thinking is this the best system that i'm putting into the building you know am i adding real value to my clients because we've got the we've got the time to sit and think as opposed to um you know doing all of these kind of laborious repetitive tasks so our, our aim is true digital delivery but we, we we admit and accept that there's a way to go before we get there but it's, it's a fun journey it really is indeed indeed time resource and uh, value add is it's all about that let me take one question we have a minute or so left uh, mahmoud uh, i'm going to direct a question from the audience from elias cool if you can unmute, unmute yourself while i read the question how does the covid situation impact net designers and challenge to challenge designs and get educated he says it feels like a situation requires it but at the same time in times of financial stress we tend to go back to basics would you like to take that question yeah yeah um so so again covid-19 has driven us and i'd like to say forced us to adapt fast um and to making sure you know that the mep designs are you know met client expectations and ensured that you know that's being delivered correctly and what that took is actually taking very quick measures like upskilling your current staff and colleagues and making sure that they can adapt to new tools that operate from a digital point of view so one of those things is bim 360 um the other thing is you know being able to have uh, online webinars and workshops with architects and clients you know and you could see that through video conferencing where it adds that human aspect to things so those were challenges that believe it or not we couldn't believe how fast we were able to adapt and how fast we were able you know with this covid-19 situation to learn a lot and take on a lot of lessons learned that we will will impact us in the future <clears throat> So yeah that's that's the way we look at it um and another we we see through other companies where they were able to reduce offices and learn you know that yeah there's there's a little bit of saving here where we can have you know less office space where it's only client oriented and all the work can be done from home so you know it depends how you look at it <laughs> indeed indeed i think a lot of us would have had this joke come across in our whatsapp groups you know a future situation where someone's asking a question of an organization who or what drove it transformation and digitalization in the organization was it the ceo the cio or was it the pandemic i think the answer you know is is all three so with that said thank you again panelists for a very insightful helpful discussion uh it this brings us to the the end of all the panel discussion so if i can request the panelists on the digital transformation to to sign off with a big thank you for your time and participation i'd like to say a huge personal thank you to all the panelists who have participated this morning in a very very helpful couple of hours we've had a few technical glitches but that apart i think we've had a lot of knowledge sharing and information gathering uh, from all of the panelists So thank you again. So with that I thank you Tom Ox to be um please the floor is all yours. Thank you uh Prabhaka uh, sorry I couldn't get in before you uh before you left. Um hello again everyone. Um yes as as Prabhaka mentioned our system did uh throw him a few curveballs throughout the uh throughout the conference but he was able to skillfully navigate them so um thank you uh thank you for that prabhaka 
and for guiding the conversation in such an excellent and um, considered manner. Um, there you have it, uh, MEP Conference uh, 2020, some incredible insight from our uh, expert panelists and some really interesting points of view on the biggest issues facing the MEP and HVAC sector today and, and, and indeed in the years to come. Um, I think I think my biggest takeaway is uh, is that we we all have a role to play going forward. Um, particularly from our point of view, we want the annual MEP conference to continue to grow as a platform for these types of discussions to push the conversation along and realise the full potential of our sector. Um, I'd like to take this time to remind you, as I did at the uh, the top of the show, uh, that nominations for the MEP awards are being accepted up until the 22nd of July, and full details of how to make a submission uh, for one of the sector's biggest prizes are available on our website. Um, just finally, before we part ways, I'd like to once again extend our sincere thanks to our expert panelists for sharing their time and views with us today. It is greatly appreciated. Um, also to conference chair once more, Prabhakar Kesavan uh, for acting as the man in the middle and keeping discussions on track. Um, a massive thank you uh, goes to our sponsors, Voltas, Polyfab and Trimble. And of course you, our audience, for tuning in and joining us for our first ever virtual MEP conference. Uh, we are sure this won't be the last time MEP Middle East ventures into the virtual realm, and we appreciate you taking part in our own little slice of history. Uh, until then, until next time, uh, please do stay safe and have a great day.